Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you present here. Thank you for making it on a Saturday afternoon. In today's session, we have Professor Jonathan Gill Harris talking about Global Shakespeare. This talk will start with the proposition that every story is a migrant. This is certainly true for Shakespeare's stories, which reached him from a surprisingly diverse and global range of sources. In turn, his stories have been reimagined globally, although it is useful to contextualize Shakespeare's plays in early modern English society and culture. It is also important to locate them with global circuits of reception and repurposing in order to better understand the dynamic processes of recreation that are vital to storytelling in general. After his lecture, he will be also sharing more information and very important information about the Masters in English program at Ashoka, the admissions process, timeline, financial aid offered, and the prospects of pursuing it. The last 15 minutes of the session will be dedicated to clarifying all your doubts and answering your questions. Please feel free to share your questions in the question and answer tab or the chat box as per your convenience. Before I hand it over to Professor, I would like to take this opportunity to formally him introduce him to you. So Jonathan Gill Harris is a professor of English at Ashoka University. He earned his bachelor's and master's from Auckland University and completed his DPhil from University of Sussex. Prior to coming to Ashoka, he was a professor at George Washington University where he taught since 2003. Professor Harris' research, in, research interests include Shakespeare, including Indian adaptations, early modern English theater, travel literature in the age of colonialism, early modern English writing about India, medieval and early modern Silk Road cultures, and global Jewish history. He has been working on a book project titled Secrets of My Mother's Tea, Chest, The Jewish Silk Road from Europe to India and China. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you, Anuja, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for carving out uh, an hour from your Saturday to uh, listen to me, but uh, more importantly, to get a sense of uh, how we do things at Ashoka University. And I'll be talking in particular uh, towards the end of the session about uh, the MA program and what makes our MA program really, I think, quite unique. Uh, in the Indian setting. Um, but I'm first going to talk with you about uh, Global Shakespeare, and I'm, I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, okay. So Global Shakespeare, what on earth does that mean? There's Shakespeare, and there doesn't seem to be much that's global about him apart from his dome of a forehead. Uh, but uh, in etched black and white with that dour expression, Shakespeare looks resolutely unglobal. He looks like a provincial Englishman, your typical dead white man. So what do we mean by global Shakespeare? Well, Shakespeare has spread around the globe, as Anuja pointed out in her opening uh, remarks. Shakespeare went to America and there's been a long tradition of uh, American Shakespeare's. The Folger Shakespeare Library, probably the greatest library of uh, Shakespeare related uh, uh, materials is based in Washington DC. Uh, Shakespeare's also spread to Africa and uh, has become incorporated into various uh, stories, myths and legends uh, spanning the, the width and uh, breadth of the continent. In my native New Zealand, Shakespeare has also become part of Māori culture. As you can tell from this uh, collection of poems, Nā Waiata Aroa a Hakepia, uh, love sonnets by Shakespeare, and there's Shakespeare uh, sporting a uh, Māori tattoo. Shakespeare is also big in India. And yes, this is a shameless plug. This is the cover of uh, my recent book, uh, Masala Shakespeare, How a Farangi Writer Became Indian. Uh, but Shakespeare truly has become Indian. He's arguably the biggest screenwriter in Bollywood of the last uh, 40 years, as an enormous number of uh, adaptations of his plays have been turned into Hindi films. And 
we should also note that uh, all sorts of regional film industries have also adapted Shakespeare. Bengali, Tamil, Malayalam, most recently with the film Jijo, an adaptation of Macbeth. Now, this suggests that Shakespeare has truly become global, but I'm still not entirely happy with this version of global Shakespeare because it still puts Shakespeare first as if Shakespeare is the origin and the rest of the world comes second as an afterthought to the great man. My question today is, what if we understand Shakespeare as having always been global? In other words, the globe isn't something that comes after Shakespeare. Rather, the globe is what makes Shakespeare, Shakespeare. And I'm going to try and answer this question in three parts. First of all, most of you probably know that Shakespeare's theater was called the globe. He clearly thought a lot about the globe. And in the globe theater, before the age of television, before the age of the Discovery Channel, Londoners would go to Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in order to see the world, quite literally. There was apparently an inscription on the entrance of Shakespeare's theatre in Latin that said, totus mundus agit histrionum. That translates literally as all the world acts a play but we might recognize in it the familiar Shakespearean line, all the world's a stage. And Shakespeare certainly brought all the world onto a stage. It's remarkable how many of his plays are set in Italy. Merchant of Venice and Othello are both set obviously in Venice. The two gentlemen of Verona and Romeo and Juliet set in Verona, North Italian town. The Taming of the Shrew is set in Padua. Uh, quite near Verona. Titus Andronicus, The Rape of Lucrece, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus are set entirely or partly in Rome. Much Ado About Nothing is set in Messina in Sicily. And A Winter's Tale is also set in Sicily. Twelfth Night has Italian characters who live in an imaginary place called Illyria. They speak English, of course, but uh, this might as well be another version of Shakespeare's Italy, a more phantasmatic Italy of the imagination. Shakespeare also set his plays in the Mediterranean beyond Italy. Othello voyages from Venice to Cyprus. Most of that play features an African set in Cyprus. Antony and Cleopatra actually goes to Africa. Most of that play is set in Egypt, in Alexandria. One of his uh, least known plays, but it was the biggest hit during his lifetime, Pericles, is set variously in Antioch, Tyre, and Tarsus, which are now in modern day Turkey, Syria, and North Africa. The play goes all the way around the Mediterranean, in the process traversing three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. The Comedy of Errors is also set in Turkey, in Ephesus. And Shakespeare ventures even beyond the Mediterranean into a larger globe. The Tempest voyages from Milan and Naples in Italy to Tunis in North Africa, and then to Bermuda, arguably, in America. In Midsummer Night's Dream, in a way that uh, people don't often realize, goes from Athens in Greece to India. Titania, the queen of fairies, recalls how she used to spend time with her uh, vestal uh, maiden uh, comrade on the scented uh, sands of India. But even this doesn't do justice to the way in which Shakespeare was global. His imagination roamed globally. But as I've argued, the globe made Shakespeare. And here I want to quote something in Hindustani. Hardastan Safarhe. Every story is a migrant. We're so used to locating stories in one place. Ah, that story is English. 
This story is Italian. This one, however, is Indian. But it's worth pausing to reflect that stories like humans migrate. They're told from person to person and people who consume stories move with the stories they've heard and tell them to other people in different locations. And eventually stories travel around the world. Now, how is a story born? It's a complex answer. And I'm going to give you an example of a story that is a migrant that will show us Shakespeare may have been born in England, but Shakespeare's stories are not straightforwardly English. So we're all familiar with the Panchatantra. Many of you may have read this version of the Panchatantra in English, uh, a children's book. Um, and we all know that uh, the Panchatantra in this English version is based on older Sanskrit stories that date back thousands of years. We may think of these stories as Hindu stories, but they're actually based on older Buddhist Jataka tales, some of which uh, have origins that go beyond the subcontinent to places like Java, uh, where we can see uh, the remains of old Buddhist engravings telling Jataka stories. Now, these Buddhist stories became incorporated into the Sanskrit canon of stories that became the Panchatantra, but they didn't stay put in India. The Panchatantra, Hindu reworkings of Buddhist stories, then migrated to Persia, where they became known as the Hazar Destan, uh, because Persian is close to Hindustani, you'll be able to recognize that Hazar Destan in Persian means a thousand stories, Hazar Dastan. Now, this was a fifth century translation of the Panchatantra, which added Zoroastrian stories to the Hindu reworkings of Buddhist Jataka tales. And the Hazar Dastan eventually, through a series of metamorphoses, became what we know as the Alf Laila Va Laila, an Arabic collection of tales from the 10th century. This is often translated as Arabian Nights, but the correct translation is 1001 Nights. Now the 1001 Nights we associate with the Muslim world of Baghdad, but these are Muslim reworkings of Zoroastrian translations of Hindu reworkings of Buddhist Jataka tales. And they're even more than that. A Thousand and One Nights also included stories from China because Baghdad was a major mercantile center that attracted travelers from all over the Silk Road. Indian merchants, Chinese merchants, Persian merchants, merchants from Egypt, from Spain came to Baghdad and told stories. So the Alf Laila Va Laila was an Islamicized collection of Persian Zoroastrian stories that reworked Hindu retellings of Buddhist Jataka tales, but also added Chinese Taoist and Confucian stories. And Alf Laila Va Laila also included Jewish stories. Here's one. You can see a picture here, the Island King in the pious Israelite. In fact, Alf Laila Va Laila is Arabic for 1001 Nights, but it's also Hebrew for 1001 Nights because Arabic and Hebrew are as close to each other as, say, Hindi and Urdu. Now, this Jewish story added to an Islamicized collection of Persian Zoroastrian stories that reworked Hindu retellings of Buddhist Jataka stories that also added Chinese Taoist and Confucian stories. Some of these Jewish tales were reworkings of old Roman tales. A pagan Latin story by a man named Plautus was turned into a play called the Menaikmi. And it told the story of a merchant shipwrecked on an island in the middle of nowhere, who is separated from his wife and his two twin sons are separated from each other. The Menaikmi was eventually adapted by Shakespeare into his play, The Comedy of Errors in 1590. So this Comedy of Errors, an English play 
is a reworking of a Latin play that is in turn a reworking of a Jewish story that became part of a Muslim collection of tales that were a reworking of a Zoroastrian collection that reimagined Hindu retellings of Buddhist stories. Confused? It gets even more confusing. The comedy of errors migrated with the English to Bengal. The Bengalis, of course, like to say, everything that happens in India happens first in Bengal, but Shakespeare certainly happened first in Bengal before he reached the rest of India. And in the 19th century, the comedy of errors was reimagined by the Bengali reformer and writer Ishwachandra Vidyasagar as a novella, Branti Bilas, or Branti Bilosh. Now, this novella eventually became reworked in the 1960s as a Bengali avant-garde film called Branti Bilosh, made by Manu Shen. Uh, and this film in turn inspired a young poet and filmmaker named Gulzar, who adapted it into a film called Angur in the 1980s. This film was a massive smash. It's about twins who've been separated and it contains an echo of Bronte Bilosh, which in turn contains an echo of the comedy of errors, which in turn contains an echo of Plautus's Menaikmi, which in turn contains an echo of A Thousand One Nights, which is an echo of the Hazar Dastan, which is an echo of the Panchatantra, which is an echo of the Jataka tales. In other words, something of the Panchatantra has traveled around the world through Shakespeare before migrating back to India in almost unrecognizable form. Now, I think it's very interesting to examine historically, socially, politically, economically, the networks of connection that resulted in stories migrating along certain pathways like the Silk Road in ways that connected parts of the world that we now think of as absolutely separate. West is West and East is East and never the twain shall meet was a common refrain. And it's a refrain that to a certain extent, even in an age of globalization, we abide by, we still want to distinguish absolutely between the world of Shakespeare in the West and the world of say Kalidas in the East. But this account of how stories are migrants might give us pause and might make us reflect on the fact that imagination is always cosmopolitan. Any story we tell is a reworking of elements that we've encountered elsewhere that may come from unexpected parts of the world. We live in a world of nations divided by borders, but imagination, like birds, like the wind, like the weather, crosses borders. And so does Shakespeare's imagination. Now, the third way in which I'm going to answer the question of how can we think of Shakespeare's always having been global is by thinking about how Shakespeare globalized with his language through the device of the pun. Now, if you stop to think about it, the pun is not simply a slightly irritating figure of speech. It's something that we encounter in particular in cultures that have a lot of contact with multiple languages. Because a word in one language will sound exactly like a word that means something completely different in another language. And a culture that puns is a culture that has been exposed to both these languages. Now, Shakespeare, this may sound scandalous, didn't write in English because English did not yet exist as a language. It would only be formalized as a language with rules of grammar, uh, with dictionaries defining what the vocabulary was about a hundred years later. But Shakespeare in his globe theater was writing for an audience that was diverse and spoke many languages. His audience consisted of people from the north of England, 
who spoke a dialect that was close to Scandinavian. It consisted of people who came from other parts of England who spoke dialects that were very Germanic. It consisted of richer people who had for centuries spoken a dialect that had a lot of French in it. And it consisted of people whose parents and grandparents had gone to church and heard every Sunday Latin as the language of Christian ceremony. All these languages were part of the stew, the kitchery in which Shakespeare wrote. And adding to the mix were other languages that had come with merchants to London, which was something of a boom capitalist town. Living in London were merchants from Portugal, Holland, and especially Italy. Shakespeare's language had to accommodate people who spoke all these languages. And we can see this in the opening lines to Romeo and Juliet. The first four lines include a series of dizzying puns that can only make sense if we realize that Shakespeare was writing for audience members who spoke many languages. Now, these four lines are usually excluded from modern productions because they're difficult for a modern audience to grasp, but I'm going to go through them with you. The first two characters we see in Romeo and Juliet are not Romeo and Juliet, but two gundas named Samson and Gregory. They belong to a family called the Capulets who are at war with another clan, the Montagues. These are street fighting men. You know, they're gangsters. And Samson, the name is biblical. It refers to a great big he-man who in the Bible was the strongest man on the planet. The Samson fancies himself as a strong he-man too. He says, Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. Gregory replies, no, for then we should be colliers. Samson, I mean, if we be in cola, we'll draw. Gregory, I, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. Now you might be thinking, eh, what is this about? But obviously you picked up on the fact that there was a sequence of puns on coal, coal, collier, collar, collar. Now, what do they all mean? To carry coals means to put up with insults. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals means Gregory, we're not going to put up with insults. Yo, bro, no one's going to diss us. Gregory replies, no, for then we should be colliers. Colliers means a carrier coal. Gregory is saying, no, if we carry coals, that would mean we were by profession colliers, and we're not colliers. We're gangsters, bro. Samson says, I mean, if we be in cola, to be in cola means to be angry. I mean, if we be in angry, we'll draw. If we get angry, we'll draw, not meaning we'll take out crayons and draw a picture, but we'll draw our swords and we'll fight. Yo, bro, if anyone diss us, we're going to pop a cap in their butt, says gangster Samson. And Gregory replies, I, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. Collar meant a hangman's noose. Gregory is saying, Samson, calm down. Don't do anything that will result in you being hanged, executed. Now, why all these puns? What's interesting is that each of them comes from a different language. Coal comes from the German coal, meaning coal. Colliers comes from the French word collier, which means a carrier of coal. Coller, meaning angry, comes from the Latin colère which means angry. And collar comes from the Italian collare, which means a collar. Shakespeare's trading on the fact that everyone in his audience understands these words because they're used to hearing different languages as they speak with each other. Now, this is very important. At the beginning of a play, Romeo and Juliet, which is about love between a girl and a boy from two different clans, from clans that shouldn't marry, but they do. Shakespeare seems to be saying that language and love are alike. German and French shouldn't be in the same sentence. 
But here they are, meeting up with each other. Latin and Italian also meet up. Similarly, Montague and Capulet, Romeo and Juliet, also are going to hook up. The moral seems to be that which we try to fence in behind borders will always find ways of connecting across those borders. This seems to be a vital part of Shakespeare's global imagination. It's part of the world that he lived in, part of the world he was writing for. And this may sound familiar to us in 2022. Shakespeare's language in which words cross borders, depicting lovers who cross borders, it's very similar to the Hinglish that we speak now. Now, I want to compare an example from, um, I'm not going to play the video, but it's uh, from a film called Ishik Zade, which is an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet in Hindi set in Uttar Pradesh. The Romeo in this film is a Hindu. The Juliet is a Muslim. <gasps> Love jihad. No wonder the current chief minister of Uttar Pradesh has set up anti-Romeo squads. He wouldn't have liked Romeo and Juliet at all. Now, in this film, at the beginning, there's a song called Jhalla And it seems unrelated to the rest of the film, apart from the fact that it's a wedding at which the Hindu Romeo and the Muslim Juliet meet each other. And a Nach girl sings this song and dances to it, Jhalla Now, this is a Hindi film, but the secret of Hindi films is that they're never really just in Hindi. They're in many languages because the audiences who come to watch Hindi films speak many languages. And this song, Jhalla is a classic example. Jiska naam jigar pe ye chot, jiske jane se bham fate, atam bham, ho jaye bisaport, aashikon ki hai shamat, ya afat hai, chand pe bhi hai aai kayamat hai. Ashikon me jiska title Titanic. Mua kinara dika kar ke duba de gaya. Hamne samja ta golden jubilee jise. Voto matine dika kar ke chuma le gaya. Jisko mahabat ka teacher kete rahe. Vo fat teacher ek lesson me fail ho gaya. What do you notice about the language here? It moves between Hindi and Urdu, and English, and Persian. And in that last line, mera hero, mera ashik, mera majnu, mera sayon, it is moving between Hindi, Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani, and English, Greek, hero is from Greek, ashik is Persian, majnu is Arabic, it's all over the place. And this is a wonderful introduction to a film in which Muslim and Hindu will get together. In this song, Hindi and Urdu gets together to produce that language that used to be called Hindustani before everyone attempted to assert borders and put Urdu in Pakistan and Hindi Sanskritized as the language of the Vedas and so on. So this may make us think about Shakespeare a little bit differently. Shakespeare's language is the language of Ishik Zade, not because it contains Hindi and Urdu and Persian and Arabic, but because it contains many languages jostling with each other, punning with each other, mating with each other. Shakespeare was always global. Shakespeare was always Desi. And that's why when we teach Shakespeare to Shoka in the MA program, we're not teaching English Shakespeare. We're teaching a Shakespeare that attempts to cast light on how Shakespeare's language and practice was always immersed in global circuits of language and storytelling. These are some of the courses we teach in the Global and Indian Shakespeare's concentration in the MA at Ashoka. Masala Shakespeare, which is about 
Hindi film adaptations of Shakespeare, but also how they're not just adaptations, how they reveal something about Shakespeare, just as Ishik Zadeh does, the multilingual nature of Shakespeare's audience. Staging the Orient is a course about how Shakespeare imagines the Orient, but also how the world he imagines ends up shaping the world that comes to watch his play. Spectres of Hamlet is about the ghost of Hamlet's father, the spectre, but it's also about all the other spectres of Hamlet, the ghosts that have survived Hamlet in various parts of the world, including Russia and, thanks to Vishal Bhardwaj, Heder in Kashmir in India. Apparitions of Macbeth, similarly, is a play about, is a course about the apparitions that Macbeth sees in that play, but also about the apparitions that have survived the play in film form in America, Japan, and Vishal Bhardwaj again, Makbul, but also Mandar, the Bengali uh, uh, um, uh, Netflix series, and uh, 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 Viram and uh, Georgi, uh, these are Malayalam versions of Macbeth and a course on Shakespeare and the Silk Road about all the stories that circulated uh, between Asia and England. So I hope this has given you something of a sense of how we do Shakespeare very differently at Ashoka. We do Shakespeare in a way that doesn't put Shakespeare on a pedestal, but brings Shakespeare down to earth and an earth that is also ours, a zamin that includes Asia. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about Ashoka, as promised by Anuja, um, and the MA program. I'll share my screen again here. Um, and um, I'll talk just very quickly about the Master of Arts uh, English program here and what makes it distinguish, uh, distinguishes it. I'm sorry, I seem to have fallen back into the, the wrong one. Uh, let me try again. Okay, hopefully there. Um, so the Master of Arts in English, um, I'll give you a quick overview here. Um, so just as we teach Shakespeare as a global phenomenon rather than an English phenomenon, something that can speak to us in our Desi context, the MA in English explores literature across genres, cultures, and chronologies, but always mindful of where we're based here in the subcontinent. We emphasize creative and critical thinking. Our courses don't consist of lectures, but discussions. Everyone is meant to have read whatever has been set before class and written about it. And class consists of us coming together to ask questions of each other. We keep saying at Ashoka, you need to become comfortable with staying on the left-hand side of the question mark. We're not rushing to answers. We're interested in ways of opening up rather than finalizing and fixing. Research is important in the spirit of questioning. Every master's student at Ashoka will write a research thesis. And also in the spirit of questioning, we ask you to take at least one course outside of English to get outside of the silo of the discipline so you can question it from the outside. And we are, as I've stressed, always engaged with the larger world we live in, mindful of our South Asian context. Um, again, I seem to have lost the share. Let's uh, try again, I'm sorry about this. Uh, so, The course structure, ours is a two year program, four semesters. Students pursue concentrations if they wish, and we have a number of concentrations uh, available to you. Gender and sexuality studies, South Asian literatures, modern literature and culture, global medieval culture, global and Indian Shakespeare's and creative writing. And we've listed courses that we taught here that teach here as part of each concentration. Every student will do a total of 48 credits, and that means 12 credits per semester during the four semesters in your program. 
Each course carries four credits. The final year thesis will carry eight credits over the full year. Uh, and so this is how the courses break down. Every semester you do one required course with your entire cohort. The first semester, it's a seminar on literary theory. The second semester, it's a course in research methods and uh, academic writing. And then the last two semesters, uh, you're doing a thesis workshop called the Pro Seminar. We have a large and distinguished faculty in English uh, who come from all parts of the world. Um, and they're even more than the ones listed here. And there's information here about uh, the timeline for application. Uh, applications started on 1st of December, uh, but you have until the 4th of March to apply. Um, those who are picked uh, for the next round will do an on-the-spot uh, essay that they'll write. Um, and then those who advance to the next round will do an interview starting on the 25th of April. And we'll notify all the successful uh, applicants by the 17th of May. Uh, a lot of people will be interested in the fee structure. Yes, an MA at Ashoka is expensive. Uh, it costs uh, five lakhs, a little bit more each year. That includes uh, not only tuition, but also residence fees. Um, the total is uh, around uh, 6.8 lakhs per year. But, and it's a big but, Ashoka offers very generous financial aid packages ranging from 25% uh, waiver on tuition to full waiver on tuition, residence, and meals. Um, we accept people based on their merit. Um, if uh, you cannot afford to come to Ashoka, but you deserve to come to Ashoka, we will find ways of paying for you uh, to make sure that you are able to come to Ashoka. And this gives you an indication of the number of students on aid. In our first batch, 16 out of 23 were on aid. Um, uh, the second batch, 10 out of 15 were on aid, including, uh, I think, four students on full aid. So as you can tell, they're very generous packages available. Now, I'm free to answer any questions you have, either about Global Shakespeare or about Ashoka. Uh, so, Anuja, if you want to direct questions my way, I'm happy to, uh, to field them. Yes, yes. Thank you, Professor. I shall start off with the first one. Uh, I think this is more of a comment where Keith mentioned that, sir, because Shakespeare is known as the father of English literature, he gave it a new form in terms of drama, sonnets, and stories. The idea of tragic flow of flaw diving deeper into human follies. Um, so and let me just respond to that quickly. Uh, yeah. I'll do a little bit of teaching here. Um, Shakespeare may be known as the father of English literature. I actually intensely dislike terms like the father of. It's deeply patriarchal, but it's also inaccurate. It presumes that there is one person, one mind that is the origin of literature. And I hope that what I presented indicates to you that stories never come from one place or one mind. Stories are the results of collaborations between people, between cultures, between languages over time. Shakespeare is a collaborator too. Okay, what's the next uh, question or comment? Yeah, the next question is, uh, does financial aid for Ash the present Ashoka students carry forward to the MA if we apply for it? I think it is from an in-house Ashoka student. Yes, um, I can't answer that with certainty, but uh, what I do know is that many Ashoka students have come to uh, our MA program. And if they've been on financial aid uh, as undergraduates, uh, they have uh, also got financial aid as graduates. But uh, I think uh, one needs to reassess uh, one's financial situation. There are cases in which people are poorer than they were when they started at Ashoka. There are cases in which uh, people are richer than they were when they started. Uh, but we're attending to your situation now. Uh, we're not thinking simply about you historically. Uh, so I imagine the financial aid office would want to 
uh, consider your situation afresh. Thank you, Professor. The next question is, I think from an ex-student, hello, sir, couldn't resist the temptation to attend one of your lectures. I sincerely hope you plan to release some of your lectures online for the perusal of your fans and ex-students. Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have no plans to monetize uh, my, my assets. Uh, I, I think the best thing to do is apply to Ashoka and, uh, come, and uh, come and talk with me. Um, but uh, you're also welcome to um, read my book, Masala Shakespeare, uh, which uh, talks a lot about some of the ideas that uh, I've uh, uh, discussed today. Thank you, Professor. The next question is, uh, King Lear revolves around a king and his three daughters with the motif of the outcast child. Similar motif is present in a Kashmiri folktale with the difference of sons replacing the daughters. The actual date and origin of this tale is unknown. How do we know who told the story first? Can it be the work of imagination of a Kashmiri storyteller before Shakespeare said it or vice versa? Um, it's an interesting question. I think we get very hung up on the idea of what comes first. Um, it's no accident that the idea of originality is something that we cherish in a capitalist society uh, where we're invested in property and imagination has become intellectual property. If I got there first, I own the idea. Um, and you know, copyright law, patent law, uh, helps strengthen that conviction. Um, the fact is ideas are global citizens and they circulate. We'll never be able to tell which story comes first. Shakespeare's story of uh, um, a man and his uh, three children, um, certainly has uh, antecedents in other parts of the world. Uh, whether it originates in Kashmir, we can't tell. Chances are that the Kashmiri story is a result of uh, uh, someone having heard a story that came from somewhere else too. Um, I think we shouldn't uh, be hung up on where something starts. We should be interested more in the phenomenon of stories traveling. And I think that's what's most interesting. If we are hung up on what comes first, we then begin to say, it's mine, not yours. But if we get more interested in how things travel, then we start to value connection, links between what is normally not linked. And that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Tarun. Hi, Professor Harris. I love the idea that stories are migrants, but are there any theoretical reflections on it? Stories as migrants is a powerful framework, just like genre, period, art movement to look at literature. Any, ex any essential texts to explore this idea in depth? Well, I think uh, um, there's a lot one can read. Uh, there isn't one theory of this. Um, there are lots of theorists who've spoken about uh, uh, movement and migration, including Gilles Deleuze and uh, Felix Guattari in their book, A Thousand Plateaus. Um, but I don't think one needs to go to Europe uh, to discover uh, the theory of uh, migration. Um, th there's actually a fascinating book by someone called uh, Michael Moran, which is about uh, Silk Road literatures. And uh, I think the Silk Road itself uh, Alf Laila va Laila, A Thousand and One Nights, theorizes what it means to be a story that moves across borders. Uh, one doesn't need to be French um, to, to be a theorist with a capital T. I think all stories theorize in the literal sense of theory, which is thinking, taking apart, putting back together and asking questions of the world we live in. So I'd say A Thousand and One Nights is one of the best theoretical texts of the movement of stories. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there's another question from the same person that on the masters uh, in English at Ashoka is stories as migrants a possible concentration to research. And is there a single year option for masters? Also is the thesis literary critical or can it be a creative project too? So the answer to your first two questions is no. Um, uh, the stories, are, there are six concentrations, the concentrations that I shared with you. Um, and uh, there are specific courses attached to these concentrations. 
Uh, the stories as migrants theme is uh, very dominant in uh, at least two of the concentrations in the global and Indian Shakespeare's and the global medievalism's concentration. But there's no standalone concentration on stories as migrants. Uh, there's no single year option for an MA unless one has been an undergraduate at Ashoka and done the fourth year, in which case uh, someone who's done a fourth year at Ashoka in English, that fourth year counts as the first year for their MA. So in other words, they spend just one year doing the MA uh, courses uh, after that. Um, but uh, I can answer in the affirmative to your last question, the thesis can be creative. Um, creative writing is, after all, one of the concentrations. Uh, also, the next question is from the second, from the same person, uh, saying that he loves reading literary texts and seeing your stories as migrants' idea in practice. But how do I get myself to start enjoying doing literary theory and applying theoretical insights to my readings of texts? I'm only worried about how I'll fare in the mandatory theory seminar. I know literary theory can be thrilling if I do it right. And that's why I'm asking this question. Uh, the best way to start doing theory is to start doing theory. <laughs> it's the same way as learning any language. It's a language. It's intimidating at first from the outside, but the more you do it, the more you read it, the more you speak it, the more it becomes something that you acquire fluency in. But I wouldn't mystify theory with a capital T. Um, there's a way in which theory can be horribly elitist and uh, jargony, um, at least as practiced by uh, people who believe themselves to be doing theory. I think that there's a way in which we live in theory in our everyday lives. As soon as we start asking questions of the world, as soon as we start trying to work out, why is the world like this? Why can't it be like this instead? As soon as we start asking questions that might unsettle the natural way of thinking about the world, questions that uh, people in power might not always like, we're in theory. So I would uh, suggest that uh, uh, rather than um, feeling a constriction of the chest at the thought of doing theory because it's going to be so hard, um, that you might think about resources you already have at your fingertips. If you've ever asked a question of the world, you're a theorist. Thank you, Professor. The next question about, is about the process of financial aid, that how does one apply for it? Well, if one applies uh, for the MA in English at Ashoka, there will be uh, on the uh, website uh, links uh, where you can start uh, the process of uh, a financial aid application. It comes after the MA application proper, uh, but at every point you will be directed, should you need aid, uh, to the financial aid office. Um, and uh, that should be a fairly easy and uh, stress-free process. Uh, the next question is about, can you give us an insight into the different electives available? In addition to literature, I'm also interested in English language, teaching, and linguistics. Will it be possible to pursue all three of my interests at Ashoka? Well, the answer to that question is a bit uh, tricky uh, because uh, uh, our electives change every year. Yeah. We're not like a Delhi University or public universities elsewhere in India where you have a set curriculum that is set in stone and is unchanging from year to year to year. Professors devise new courses each year. In other words, professors teach what interests them, and hopefully this will be much more interesting to you. But I've mentioned the six concentrations that we have. So you can expect courses that speak to those concentrations in um, South Asian uh, literatures, modern language and culture, gender and sexuality, global medievalisms, global and Indian, global and Indian Shakespeare's and creative writing. Um, we do not offer courses in linguistics in English, um, but uh, Rita Kotari's uh, courses on translation theory, which are part of the South Asian literature's uh, concentration, are very much engaged with linguistics and linguistic theory. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question is about, to what extent was Shakespeare conscious of doing what he does? 
is the globalizing tendency within Shakespeare something that can be attributed in its entirety to the man himself? Or is it a feature that arises out of critical analysis? So again, I think uh, in our capitalist age, because we privilege property and intellectual property, we're hung up on the idea of the individual genius who is working in some kind of vacuum and whose ideas belong to him. And it's so often him, isn't it, alone. Um, now, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, Freud started to theorize the unconscious. And I do believe that uh, a lot of literature emerges from the unconscious that Shakespeare was often not conscious of what he was doing. He was drawing on elements that were largely unconscious to him. But unlike Freud, who sees the unconscious as sort of a locked back room in our individual brains, I see the unconscious as something much more social and collective. That Shakespeare was drawing on cultural unconsciousness uh, that involved elements that he wasn't uh, consciously aware of, but that became part of uh, the cultural and linguistic legacy uh, that was a result of the various transactions across borders, across vast expanses of distance uh, that were engineered in part by mercantile trade along the Silk Road. So Shakespeare would have been aware that he was punning at the beginning of uh, Romeo and Juliet. Was he aware that these puns came from four different languages? Maybe not because he, like speakers of English, uh, was speaking many languages without necessarily knowing where the languages come from. When you sing along with Dave D and sing um, uh, emotional atatya, uh, bola bola vaya did you ditch me, a zindigi le le yara um, you may not be conscious of the fact that you are speaking Hindi and Urdu and English and Bhojpuri. You are just moving from language to language, as so many Indians do, um, in the process of making sense to someone else. So I, a lot of what is beautiful about Shakespeare, I don't attribute to the genius of the man himself. I don't believe in individual genius, at least in the sense we fetishize it. But I do believe in the extraordinarily, the extraordinarily rich creative energy of cultural dialogue across borders, across languages. We believe so much in purity too. We're living in a time where over and over again, we're told should Hindi is the best, shuddha is the best. Why should shuddha be the best? Impurity is often what generates the most exciting and innovative ideas. When two elements from totally different backgrounds come together and collide, Montague and Capulet, Romeo and Juliet, Hindu and Muslim, Persian and Sanskrit. That's when beautiful new creations happen. Shakespeare was at the crossroads of so many collisions. He was historically fortunate to be there, but so are we in our current moment. Okay, I think we got time perhaps for two more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Um, there is one question from Kirti. I want to pursue my master's in English, but want to do specialization in creative writing. So is it possible? Or does Ashoka offer any internship as well? Kirti, as I pointed out in my presentation, one of the concentrations is creative writing. So yes, you can do creative writing. Uh, we have a very strong creative writing program. Uh, do we offer internships? Uh, we don't have a systematic internship program, but there are research assistantships available on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with our faculty. All our faculty are very active writers and uh, producers of books. Uh, and uh, all the time we need help uh, in uh, various aspects of our writing processes, our research. Thank you, Professor. There is one question, uh, like few questions related to the application. So if you could just share some insight into the essay writing part of the application, um, I think it could help the aspirants. So an essay is not something you crack. I, I often hear people talking about how they cracked the board exam. Um, there isn't a kunji that you can look at 
There aren't keywords you can mug up. For your essay, we are interested in how you think. We're interested also in how you write. Now, we're not talking necessarily about perfect Queen's English from a grammatical point of view. Um, we're interested in your ability to connect your thoughts, to put together an argument, to ask questions. So these essays, they should not be short two sentence answers with keywords in them. They should be attempts to think through an argument of some kind. And the more you can ask questions, rather than sound like a mansplaining uh, dispenser of gyan, the better. As I've said, we encourage people to stay on the left-hand side of the question mark. If we sense that you're someone who is asking genuinely interesting questions, someone who is genuinely curious, rather than someone who is simply looking for facts that they can recite in an exam or in a quiz, uh, then we're going to be much more interested in you. Uh, thank you, Professor. I have shared some relevant links in the chat box, which could help the aspirants currently present here, who's interested in, the, uh, in pursuing the application. Um, just a small reminder that we are nearing the deadline. It's on the 4th of March. So you still have around a month, uh, or no, actually less than a month in hand to complete your application. In the next few days, if you feel that you would like to get in touch with any of us, feel free to reach out to me on my mail ID uh, with respect to any query related to the application form. I will try my best to help you out. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the lovely session. I am sure uh, that all the participants here have enjoyed it thoroughly and I'm definitely sure that they are really we want you to answer all their questions but due to paucity of time we cannot continue <coughs> anymore, but we really hope that we get to see you more often in the coming in the upcoming sessions thank you and i'm sorry i couldn't answer all the questions uh if you write me an email you will find my email address on the website i'll try to respond if i haven't been able to answer your question thank you very much anuja and thank you everyone for for coming today Wishing you all the best, wishing you a COVID-free summer.